to allow Holy Spirit to move and, and let JD, <laughs> Pastor JD speak today. So we're going to, if you reach out your hands again, this yeah. is an active church. Amen. So God, we just thank you for JD. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, just fill him up right now. Let him speak your word. Let him speak the message that you have for your people today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the testimony and for the heart that you've given Pastor J.D., that he would want to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth right now as it is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Fill him up, God. Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Amen. How's that? Better? Hallelujah. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. <clears throat> If you don't sleep for long periods of time, you will get tired. If you don't eat for long periods of time, you will get hungry. If you don't sleep for long periods of time, and then you add the other two to it, you will become sick. When you get busy, busy moving and chasing down schedules, and flying and changing elevations and doing that stuff, because you're fearfully and wonderfully made, you're going to be in trouble if you don't pay attention. So paying attention is very, very important. But we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Last week I had an opportunity to share. I don't know if you heard about it, but... Just a, just a little tidbit that <clears throat> we believe revival is going to happen. Through the years, <clears throat> I have gotten into some conversations with people who thought that they could preach better than I could, run the church better than I could do a lot of things better than they thought that I was doing it. <clears throat> and if we're going to be a part of the revival of our God, we have to learn something here. And uh, this has been very, very, very strong in me since Matt and Leah has taken over. And... Uh, I have learned something that maybe I should have learned many, many years ago. But we are the church. It isn't this building. We are the church. There's a purpose for that. There's a purpose to know that. And I know many of you know that. But the people out there in Wonderland, there's a lot of them out there wondering why we all congregate together in a building and, 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 and you know, Treat the building like it's someplace special, which it is. Granted, it's a good place for the church to come and be together. Don't forsake the gathering together of one another. I feel like I'm going to look down and get real loud. I'm going to move that down a little bit. How's that better, Dave? I'm going to do a little bit of reading this morning. And those of you who have the fire Bible, there is a place in your Bible on 1557 that says the church. And I've often questioned, you know, when Jesus was talking to Peter and he said, on this rock, I will build my church. And he emphasized my church. And to me, I thought, man, that's, that's pretty good. And I've had a lot of people wonder, what? What does that mean? So I'm going to attempt. 
I lost my little ruler. I have a little ruler here that I use to read to keep me from losing a line. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, little ruler, where'd you go? Oh, never mind, I found it. It's fun to have a ruler with you when you read and you try to keep the line. But we're going to look at Matthew 16, 18 to begin with. He says, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, see, he didn't change his name. He says, you are Peter. And on this rock, what was he meaning there? It was something Peter had said to him. It was the faith of Peter. It was, it was the boldness. It was the strength in Peter to know Jesus Christ as Messiah, Savior. This has happened many a times in the scriptures when people recognize Jesus as Messiah. And, and even like the thief on the cross on his right hand side, when he called him Messiah, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. And he says, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, back a couple of more pages, there is a whole, whole study on the gates of hell. But you guys know as well as I do that there is a positive and a negative in this world. And us being the church, we're positive. And there's definitely a negative. Okay. Hallelujah. That negative is working against our children. It's working against our young people. Uh, it's exciting to hear that these, these uh, revivals are breaking out amongst the youngsters, the, young, the younger generation. It's powerful and it's exciting. And my prayer for that younger generation, that it grabs a hold of them that they don't let go ever. You know, we've seen things through time where things have devastated the United States or even parts of the world. And, and talk, it causes the whole world to go into prayer and, and seeking God. And that lasts for two or three months and then it's over. But the, and I'm not, I'm not going to read all of the scriptures in that, but I just want you to get a touch here, a taste of what we are all about. So ecclesia, which is a Greek word for church, refers to a, a meeting or a gathering of people who are called out and brought together for a purpose. Hallelujah. In the New Testament, this group is a congregation or a community of God's people, those who accept Christ's message uh, entrust their lives to him and come together as citizens of God's kingdom for the purpose of worship and honoring God. The word church can't refer to a local, local congregation of Christ followers. Give several uh, scriptures, but. Or the universal church, the worldwide community of Christ true followers. Right? It says the church is presented as God's people. This refers to all who have been spiritually saved. That's the difference between being a Christian and a born-again Christian. The born-again Christian is spiritually saved. There is a big difference. You're going to hear some more about that. Made spiritually holy and set apart for God's purposes because they have accepted the forgiveness and the new life provided by Jesus' sacrificial death for our sins. People who are part of the true church are basically pilgrims or people on a journey whose final ultimate destination is not of this earth. They are simply passing through on their way to a better home in heaven. Uh, their priority while on earth is to develop their personal relationship with God and to be unified, uh, be a unified community of people who represent God and bring honor to him 
and in all, in all that they do. The church is made up of people who are called out of the world and into God's kingdom. <clears throat> Separation from corrupt practices and lifestyles that are uh, coming uh, common in the world is a necessary part of Christ's standard for his church. Uh, this often requires personal uh, persistence. Am I reading that right? Persistence and sacrifice to move forward in the standards that God gave in the Bible. Now, I want to share one standard with you. And people, you have kids here. You're bringing them to church. It's good. They need to be in the church. They need to become part of the church. That was a standard that was mandated to the people of God in the Old Testament, very early in the Old Testament, that they're, that they're not only to be Christian people and it's supposed to show about them in their house and on their head and on their lips and all that stuff, but they are to teach the next generation. They are to teach and keep the next generation Involved, And, you know, my mom, my dad, uh, my grandmother going to parochial school and what have you, that kind of teaching was uh, like when I get old enough to get out of here, I'll never come back. And that isn't the way the church should be. The teaching should be at home. The teaching should be around the table. The teaching should be at night, at bedtime, before they go to bed. It should be like when they get into a bicycle wreck or they get into an issue with another friend or what have you, that you teach them at that time to pray and why you want them to pray. And, why they, and if you're not doing it, your children won't. All right? Now, I've, always, I've often told you that there's, if you've missed the boat on that line, if you haven't uh, rested your children into Christ, if you haven't done this, then if they have grandchildren, there's your back door. Teach the grandchildren and let them take it home. Just, just word for thought, okay? But there is a mandate given to us here. So where was I? But the reward... For remaining spiritually pure and prepared for God's purpose includes having Him as a living, uh, in, includes having Him as a living Father. Hallelujah! The church is the temple of God. Hello, we are the temple. That's why we're called the church of God and of the Holy Spirit. And this means that God's presence is among His followers. And that the church community is where God wants his presence to be seen by all people. This truth about the church demands that its people avoid worldly, immoral behavior and anything that is not right according to the standards of God's word. The church is the body of Christ, a living spiritual organism which through which Christ reveals himself and accomplishes his purpose in the world. This reality means that no true church exists without a living and active union between individual church members, individual church members, and Christ. This is where I wanted to underline something. There's something that takes place in between are amongst us church members and Christ, okay? And so my, my point today is going to bear down on this. Bear with me. Who is the head of the body? Uh, as parts of the body, church members must work together in unity, each fulfilling their God-given role with the knowledge that no individual is more important than the other. So putting Dave up on a pedestal is not, it's just telling, Matt's telling us there's a resource here that we must tap to get the information to grow. There's a resource sitting up there in the sound booth, Dave. I just want to put you up on a little pedestal. Don't stand up too quick, you'll hurt your head. <laughs> but I asked Dave to pray for me this morning. It's gone. I had an earache. It's gone, all right? Yeah. All right. 
So if you need prayer, you go to at least one or two individuals in here, Rogers being one, Dave being one. They have that ability to pray. Uh, I, if I'm leaving anybody out, now listen, I, I don't want to leave anybody out that believes you're a prayer warrior, but I mean, give, keep going. Amen? Don't stop. Don't stop. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Okay, more than the other. Right, right, right. This community of all, of all the faithful followers of Jesus for all time, this marriage image places a focus on the church devotion and faithfulness to Christ as well as Christ's love for the for uh, an intimacy with the church. You know, uh, Denise, she's talking to you guys on the phone. And you'll hear her say before she hangs up that she loves you. We've been praying for you guys for years. We've been praying for this work for years. We love you. So it's not the kind of love that we have between Denise and I. But, I mean, we love you. And I tell my brothers, I said, you know, I get ready to hang up. I love you. Yeah. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can say it. <laughs> Men have a problem with that. And they need a little nudge sometimes. You can say it. Listen, brother, I love you. And finally you get it back. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The church is a spiritual fellowship, a group of believers who are a common relationship in their love and worship of God, as well as a a uh, common interest and purpose. Hallelujah. They are the experience of God's spirit living in and through them, which brings them into the unity of the spirit. They also have access to the baptism in the spirit, right? Hallelujah. You can practice this too. You know, when you're taking a shower and you're standing there, just letting that water run on you, just pretend like you're being baptized. You can do that as often as you want. Get baptized and believe it. I, I, when I pray for people like I have this morning, I touch them where their sore is and I say, feel it. Let the hand of God touch you. It ain't me. Let, just feel it. Let it go down inside of you. Feel it. Amen. They also have access to the best baptism in the spirit which empowers them to spread his message and fulfill his plans, right? His plans, not yours, but his. And uh, where am I at now? And chart, the purpose of Christian fellowship is to live out of a common love and care for one another that is seen by these outside of the church. When we have men's fellowship breakfast, there should be a camaraderie, a love, a, a caring. You pray for each other, what have you. We do that. Do that in the women's meetings, all that stuff. Let them see it from outside the church. The church is a, the church is a spiritual ministry. It's, it serves through the use of various gifts, okay? We're going to talk about that just a little bit this morning. It's, all these are granted granted by Holy Spirit. The spiritual gifts are special God-given abilities and empowerments for the purpose to bring honor to God and spiritual and spiritually building up and uh, encouraging others in the church. Hallelujah! In the church and Christ. I got to keep changing down here because they give me a lot of uh, scriptures. The church is an army involved in spiritual conflict. It does not fight with earthly weapons, but with spiritual weapons and armor, including the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The church is in a spiritual struggle against Satan, his demonic forces and sin. Hallelujah. How many of you haven't wrestled with sin this week? The spirit which fills the and empowers the church is like a warrior whose main purpose is the living and uh, is the living and power. I got to change living in the 
powerful word of God. Hallelujah. The word is able to free people from Satan's control and to conquer every power uh, in this rebellious world that is opposed to God. Rebellion opposes God. Hallelujah. The church is a pillar of, uh, it's a pillar and a buttress of truth. That is to say, it is the basis on which truth is built and stands strong, much like the foundation that supports a building. The church must continue to uh, uphold the truth, guarding and uh, defending it against false teachers and others that who would try to change or twist its message or offer something else in its place. Have to watch that. That's why you pray for Matt and Leah. They watch that. You pray for Rogers or any of the prayer warriors in here. That that guard is always up there. Remain, amen. The church is the people with the future hope. This people is focused on Christ's return for his people. Hallelujah. Uh, they've been talking about the last days. They've been talking about rapture that thousands of years ago. And that all that all that whole scripture and everything that's in there is a hope. It was always a hope, even though they many, many have passed before the rapture. There's a plan for them, right? You guys know that. But it always has given them a hope. I, I just loved it when I read that part. Uh, yeah, amen. The church is both invisible and visible. The church is invisible. The church, invisible, is the entire body of true followers of Christ, worldwide, united, and devoted, and, and, and active faith in Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the visible church consists of loyal congregations made up faithful followers of Christ who overcome spiritual opposition and will endure to the end. Hallelujah. Local churches cannot, can also uh, contain also those who claim to follow Christ, but they do not. There's many amongst us that go to church, but they, it, it's a religious thing. Think about it. Amen. Hallelujah. They're spiritually death. They're lukewarm. Hallelujah. Uh, then it goes on note on characteristics. So, the church is built on the solid rock of bold confession and proclaiming, uh, sending out the message in all possible ways that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and this rock upon which Christ Jesus will build his church is not an individual. It is the constant and often repeated confession or message about Jesus Christ throughout the world that will increase and advance Christ's church. Nothing can completely uh, succeed in stopping the church from accomplishing God's purpose on the earth and from uh, reclaiming a spiritual territory, but was once lost to Satan and sin. All right. So there, there's a war going on. We're all in the middle. How many of you? How many of you know that? I mean, sure, everybody here knows that, right? So I give the I give you that. It's just there's so many scriptures in there that's worth studying. There's so many other places you can go. It's worth looking at. And and because I have been taking the message out now as a, as a uh, chaplain to the people that, listen, you're the church. It doesn't matter where you go, but when you go there, be the church. Okay? And I, and I, I share that with them, and they kind of look at me like, what are you talking about? But there's so many that's out there just really don't even realize that truth. Amen? Glory be unto you. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 20. There's a reason for this, okay? So 
I'm reading out of the Living Bible. And it says, Now, brothers, I want to write about the spiritual abilities the Holy Spirit gives to each one of you. Spiritual abilities is given to you by Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, he says, I don't want any misunderstanding about them. You will remember that before you became Christians, you went around from one idol to another, not one of which could speak a single word. We've all been raised up in different ways. I just want you to know. We've all been raised up in, uh, like, I, like I want to just share with you, I was raised up in a parochial school, and all I learned there was to hate it. <laughs> And anything attached to it, that church, that assembly, the teachers, the pastor, all of that, as soon as I could get away from it, man, I was a gone cat. Never to return. There was a lot of things that I've learned through that experience that has made me who I am today. This is important for each one of you to understand. There's things that's happened in your lives that can be used because you are the church. And it's going to be different for you or you or you or even myself because we're all different. We're not the same. And that's what we're going to touch on today. So it says, now you are meeting people who claim to speak messages from the Spirit of God. And how can you know whether they are really inspired by God or whether they are fakes? Here is the test. No one speaking by the power of the Spirit of God can curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord and really mean it. Okay? A lot of people speak these words simply because they've heard them enough and, and they've seen the results of it. They just go ahead and speak these words, but they really don't mean it. Unless Holy Spirit is helping them. So, like Leah prayed for me this morning, I need help to deliver the word in such a way that I, there's a point that I want to make. And that's, that's where I'm, I'm going to have a little bit of a wrestling match. But praise God, I have Holy Spirit in me. Uh, so for now, God gives us many kinds of spiritual abilities, but the same Holy Spirit who is the source of them. Hear this, please. There are different kinds of service to God, but it is the same Lord that we are serving. There are many ways in which God works in our lives, but it is the same God who works in our lives, but it is the same God that who does the work in and through all of us. If you walk up into a situation like this morning, I asked Dave, Dave, I got an earache. I need prayer. And he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to say the words that he said. And hallelujah, I become healed. It, people have people like Dave or many of you in the body here, you know where you stand in this. And it's important uh, for you to teach this to your children. To one, to one person, excuse me. To one person, spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. Someone else may be especially good at studying and teaching. And this is the gift from the same spirit. He gives special faith to another and to someone else the power to heal the sick. He gave the power for doing miracles. To some and others the power to prophesy and preach. He gives someone else the power to know whether evil spirits are speaking through those who claim to be giving God's message or whether it is really the Spirit of God who is speaking. All in, still another person is able to speak in languages that he never learned. And others who do not know the language either are given the power to understand what he is saying. It is the same and only Holy Spirit who gives all these gifts and powers. 
deciding which one of us should have it. You could be walking in Walmart and get an unction from Holy Spirit to pray for somebody. Do it. Because it's his work. The, the, the stage has been set by God. Holy Spirit is using you to do the work. Okay, just do it. I want to talk a little bit about being a project superintendent. I, I did that for 22 years. And when I started out as a job superintendent, I was young and naive. And, and I, I made mistakes. Uh, still got the job done. But in the process of dealing with people, I don't know if you guys realize that as a job superintendent, you're working for a general contractor. Okay. And a general contractor, there's a whole force of people that's in the offices of the general contractor. And then there's the owner of the company, sometimes more than one. But in the case that I was working, it was one person who owned the company. But he hired all these other people to run the company. And those people who were running the company hired individuals like myself to do the work to make the money to help run the company. Now, bear with me just a minute, all right? I have built some crazy projects, nine, eight, and nine-story buildings. Uh, just to tell you a little story, I learned how to read blueprints through Herman Schulte. In 1971, I started working with him, building houses. And Herman and I got to where we could work together so well that Herman and I could build, we could frame three houses, three houses every two weeks, just the two of us. And that was before there was nail guns and air hoses and all of that stuff. Every nail was driven by hand. The bunk would come out on the project, the, this this is what it took to build a house here. It was dropped off a truck. Boom, you break the straps around it, and you start cutting it up and carrying it. We built three houses every two weeks, Herman and I. There was other groups that worked for the same company of five that could not keep up with us. I'm not bragging, but we learned to work together. It was really important. And as Herman taught me how to read the blueprints and start preparing headers and different things like that, and of course, once you build enough of these houses, you can almost do it by heart. Uh, you just knew what the next move was. I knew what Herman's next move was. We just knew. We just knew. I carried on my shoulder every one of those houses. I was the one cutting the boards, making them fit. Herman was laying them out putting them on the floor in their sections and in their pieces. And after we put a whole wall together, we would both climb up on the wall, stand there and pound it together, stand it up, get it out of the way, and then start on another one. And we just, we just got really, really good at that. But then I got into the industry where I worked for a general contractor because of my ability to read blueprints. I mean, this is a few years down the road, but now as a job superintendent and the ability to read blueprints, I... That's why I got the job, because I could read blueprints. And I knew how things went together. I knew how they were built. Uh, we went down to downtown Denver, got into an eight-story building. I'm reading the blueprints, and I noticed on the first page that as, as all the floors were gutted out and there was nothing there, I could see that there needed to be a hole drilled in the floor in these locations, and I had to find these locations. So with different measurements and different things like that, I go up there, I find the locations. They drill an inch and a half hole in the concrete floor to the floor below. And they go down and they go down and they go down. That little hole was where, and, and Les, you can relate to this one, this is where the heat system was for the apartment. This is the little box about as big as this stage is where the heater and, and the water system and all that come into the apartment and so that little hole designated where that thing was going to sit and then I could go in and lay out each and every apartment in nine stories off of that little hole so I had a piece of PVC about this big that I put an X in it 
or a cross. Call it a cross this way, exit. Okay. And you'd lay it over that hole and find a center, and then you'd start measuring off of that. And I could measure out and lay out the kitchen walls, lay out the, the hallway walls, where the bathroom went, all of this stuff. And zippity doo dah, we go right down through there. And of course, the framers were following me around. That's all I did for about two years. I just crawl around on my hands and knees and do layouts. That's all I did. It takes a village. I guess the point I'm trying to make is it takes a village. You can't do this kind of work. And as a job superintendent now, I'm the one who tells the subs when to come in on the job. So a superintendent goes there and he, lay, he makes sure that the surveyor lays out the hole and the hole's dug and the foundation's put and all of this stuff is done. And then the erection of the building goes up and I follow it through to finish. And even in the finishes, one building we did over in Brush, uh, couldn't find people that would come in and clean the apartments. So I hired my wife. <laughs> but I mean, it, the job superintendent has to be there from beginning, scratch, layout to finish. All right? As a job superintendent, all I did is orchestrate who, when, how, and the timing. That's what, I, that's what my job was. It went from just putting a little hole in the right spot and doing layouts on that, but it went from there to just saying, okay, I need the plumbers in here. I need the electricians, so on and so on. You can't run, run all this stuff together. It's got to be done in a certain order. And you're there through the completion of the job. There's one tool that we all use. And I brought one with me. And you can't do this without this one tool. Okay? You can't do this without this one tool. This is a universal tool. It does the same thing no matter where you're building or how you're building or what have you. And if you don't pay attention to this tool, something's going to go haywire. That's the truth. We have a tool, universal. And if you don't use this tool, something's going to go haywire. Our superintendents are here, hired by God, appointed by God to orchestrate, but yet we all use the same thing. Am I making sense here? Okay. I know a lot about construction. And I have dealt with a lot of people who didn't do it the way I did. And at first I was getting angry about that because they were doing things differently than I would do it. Yet it was getting done. But it wasn't the way I thought it should be done. So I would go and try to, because I'm the boss reprimand them and tell them how to do it my way and they would look me in the eyeball and say get out of my face or I'm quitting I do know what I'm doing let's bring this back to the church okay every single one of you have been raised up in a different way and you know what you're doing but it's not Matt and Leah's way or it's not JD's way or what have you it's not the same as prayer warriors, I've learned to pray differently than others. I'm not as strong in my prayer as perhaps Rogers is. I've, I've led a lot of people to Rogers say, you want prayer. You want, you want to see answers to your, you call Rogers. I still will do that to my dying day or yours. Hallelujah. But there's people in here who... By the Spirit can do specific jobs. And you have been raised up differently than the rest of us. Do your jobs. All right? And we will trust you. Amen? Can we do that? Can we say that, Matt and Leah? We will trust you, even if you don't do it our way. I have argued with a lot of people through the years who felt like I should have been doing it different. But I said, wait a minute. I'm being led by the Spirit here. I really do believe that. And maybe I don't pray 
like with the thunder and the hollering and the carrying on. I, maybe I don't uh, articulate as best as I probably could because I, I never learned to read till I was 30. And then from then on, and you can ask Denise, I had to learn to read. This is what I learned. This is what I learned. On. I knew this long before I got this. I can put numbers together. And I, I, can, I can cut things into wood that, that's amazing. You can't believe how I figure out that stuff. It's geometry and what have you. I learned that. But there's stuff in here that I am still learning today. I have to apologize to the church because I, I, I released to Matt and Leah and I kind of got quiet and stepped back and and and... It needed to happen. And my reason for stepping back is they're not going to do it the way I do it or have done it. But I have to trust Holy Spirit in them. Okay? I have to trust you prayer warriors to continue to pray for them that things would continue to go and flow. Amen. Hallelujah. I think I've said about enough. But if you don't have one, oh, if you don't have one of these... Or one of these. Hallelujah. This is a universal tool. Glory to God. Our bodies have many parts. And many parts make up only one body when they are all put together. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. This body is fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay. Jesus Christ is the head. Can you imagine what this body here would do without a head? So it is with the body of Christ. Each of us is a part of one body of Christ. And some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles. And some are slaves. Some are free. But Holy Spirit has fitted us all together into one body. We have been baptized into Christ's body by the one Spirit and have all been given the same Holy Spirit. Yes, the body has many parts, not just one part. I must stop there. You know that's on 14. It talks about the foot and it wants to be the higher, you know, so on and so on. And it, it gets carried away that way. And I'm going to cut this off, but I'm not going to read all this. Hallelujah. Suppose a whole body were an eye. And I, I jump down uh, probably, where'd I go? I jump down there to 17. Suppose the body were, were one eye, then how would you hear? And if the whole body were just one, one big ear, then how could you smell anything, you know? So we're all different. We're all parts of a body, and we're all capable of hearing Holy Spirit and doing what He says. Amen. How many can say amen to that? Amen. Glory to God. But that's not, that isn't the way that God has made us. He has made many parts for our body and has put together, has put, to, put each part where He wants it. Uh, what a strange thing that a body would be if it had only one part. So he has made many parts, but still there is only one body. This is a message I want you guys to get. Do your thing. Know your thing. Okay. I, I, I imposed on you uh, through some teachings from other teachers uh, that you should do the A-Pest and know where, you, know where your strong suit is. And for me, it was good to know where my strong suit was. And you know what? I found out through that, that teaching that I wasn't a pastor. I wasn't a pastor. There was a couple other places where I excelled stronger and what have you. And that changed in me. And I could feel it. And I, I felt more free at that time. But what I'm trying to share with you is whatever your part is, and, and if you feel strong in one part or you feel Holy Spirit is really impressing on you to be a certain way in a certain field, then study it and become what it is. 
know it. I could not build a single thing without this. Of course, some of them were bigger than this one, but same concept. But I couldn't build a single thing without this, this tool. You cannot be who God is using you to be without this tool. You have to know and become strong in what you believe and how you are called to do it. That's the message that I want to bring in here today. When I was listening to these last week, I got this word. And I'm going to close on this. <clears throat> you have something in you from God. Something that has changed you. And it'll continue to do that. You can become a strong force in many areas. And if you're obedient to his voice, you will change. But something that has changed you. Father has made you ready for his work. You are the church. In Jesus' name. Father, let this become a reality in the body here. Hallelujah. Mm. That they would become strong. Hallelujah. Know that the revival is in them. It can be in their home. It can be in their car. It can be in their workplace. Because they're there and Holy Spirit's in them. Let them hear and know and reckon and yield according to what the word says in Romans. We give you glory, Lord, and we praise you, mighty King. I praise you, Lord, for each and every individual here as we become one whole working unified. I don't think I've ever had a battery die at a more appropriate time. Like your last two words, the perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> uh, I kind of want to bounce a few things. And we're, we're going to, David, probably kill the live stream, say goodbye to everybody online. There's some Bye. things. Bye-bye. If you want the rest, come in person.